So, Birdo. Yeah. We put a poll on Patreon asking people what the patrons wanted us to do our next big series on a public figure or something. And overwhelmingly, the patrons voted for the Duggars. And people have been asking us to cover the Duggars for eight, 10 years plus. I can imagine. And whenever we would get emails or comments on YouTube, I would always think, I wonder who these people are. I mean, I just had no right. no clue. And for the past month, you and I have been doing a crash course on the Duggars. Right. And I've just been completely obsessed with <laughs> My this My brain case. hurts now. <laughs> There's so many details, not only to the Duggars yeah. case, but also to you know, the religion that they were following and yeah. just broader evangelical Christians in the United States and the laws and the ethics and child abuse. And, you know, the, there's just so many things. Is it a cult? Anyway. Yeah. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirkanda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Berto? My name is Umberto Castaneda, and I unbraid nuts. So if you're listening to an audio version of this, there's a video version of just me and Berto's heads, if you care to watch that on YouTube. Also, I'm getting over a cold, so you might hear me a little raspy. My doctor has reassured me I'm not contagious anymore. And, and I'm sick too. I can't hear. This why I'm wearing headphones. I had COVID and then a sinus infection, then both ears are infected and I can't, like, it's horrible. You had, a, you had COVID like a couple months ago or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was on a trip on a vacation. Yeah, okay. So I want to read an email from an anonymous patron to humanize this a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, they say, "Hi, I'd love for you to talk about the Duggar family. My family idolized the Duggars. I grew up in a quiverful quiverful mm -hmm. church." I was homeschooled my entire life in a very similar way to the Duggars. The trauma of being educated in this movement goes deep for me. Please, please include an analysis of the book To Train Up a Child by Michael and Debbie Pearl. It is the book that all these families were obsessed with using to, quote unquote, train their children in the 90s and aughts. We were extremely well-behaved kids due to these abusive tactics. People would comment on how good we were all the time to my mother. Little did they know the vile things that were happening to us kids. We IBLP kids had to submit entirely. There was no such thing as consent. I'll be in therapy a long time recovering from mm. the abuse. What do you think? That's horrible, man. So sad to hear that because honestly, you're right. When you see the, the facade, like again, I, I didn't know almost anything, but I did know that there was like this family with a lot of kids. The facade that they and the overall community presents looks happy and to some extent healthy or, or whatever. And But at the very least, it doesn't seem like there's horrible abuses happening or something like that. And yes, and I, I've experienced that with other communities too, where, where everyone's like very buttoned up and behaved, but sometimes that's not accomplished in a way that's healthy. And just to hear that, you know, and this is not the first account, sadly, because I've been like you watching a lot of content from people that were in it. And yeah, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. We all know that children are abused, which is a horrible, horrible thing in our society. It happens all the time. The thing that I will often remind myself and tell people is that to really make it visceral, because you know people intellectually get it, but there are children right now at this very second being abused within a mile radius of your house, uh, yeah. so, you know, depending on statistics and this sort of thing and where you live yeah. and the density of the population. Uh, it's pretty much guaranteed that there are several children at this very second being abused to some extent. And that, to me, when I remind myself about that, it just drives home that this isn't some distant thing. It's not something we fixed. It's not nope. something in the past. It's something happening at this very second. And when we understand that, we understand that there's a lot of causes to that. But what this series, I think, will demonstrate and what the deep dive you know, going into all the data has demonstrated for me is that there's a pretty good possibility that a lot of parents would not have abused their children if they were left to their own devices. Yeah. But because of the religious cult that they these people were in, we'll get into whether or not it's a cult later on. But because of the influence of this particular sect of Christianity, 
then these parents became abusive or abusive parents became more abusive. Or parents that maybe weren't themselves abusive allowed their children to be abused because of the hierarchy that was established. And, right. Yeah. So it's not just like, oh, it's a story about children being abused. It's a story about an institution that involved millions of people over decades in which many, many right. children have been abused and many, many adults are hopefully in recovery from that. Many yeah. not, obviously, because they're probably still in the cult or they don't know to recover or they don't have access to that or they think they were to blame or something or they literally died, which we'll get into <laughs> later as well. So, yeah, it's just, it's rough. And it's across the world. It wasn't even just the U.S., which is another mind-blowing thing for me. Right. And at the, the and spread at the, of it. Yeah, and at the center of all this is a reality TV show that everyone was watching. Yeah, well, because I've also come to find that there were actual exposés and documentaries before about IBLP, but they just never got attention, really. And I think, for better or for worse, the popularity of the show the the duggars was uh, or 19 count whatever you know that actually finally was able to give it enough prominence to highlight you know shine a spotlight on this thing but yeah yeah it, it's interesting i want to touch on something related to that that when i was going into this world with the documentary and all the other documentaries and the articles mm -hmm. and everything i knew that these people are out there right right you, you hear about them but it's a whole subculture, right. a large subculture. The scope of it. Yeah. Right? In my country, maybe in my neighborhood, I don't know, that I was just completely, I mean, again, I'm, I'm aware of it, but not really aware of not it. The scope. I was, comp that's the thing. And I guess because I had friends in uh, not this specific, although actually, I don't know, probably some affiliation, some of them might have been. But in general, where we would go to these mega church events uh. at stadiums. So some of the things that, that were described, I was there. I was at some of these things. And I guess, yeah, when I think of that, that is massive. It's right. Just tens of thousands of people. Right. It's not just IBLP right. as one particular institution within Christianity in the United States. But it's emblematic of yeah. a huge movement that has been happening, which we'll also get into. Again, another tangent right. <laughs> that will go down. So yeah, so this topic branches off into a lot of topics, and I wrote down just a sampling. So obviously the Duggars, which is a huge news story, and a lot of people are interested in us talking about the details of that, of which I have been just... yeah. The documentary didn't really describe it well, I even though it was long. Right. Yeah, there's it, a lot of stuff they left out. I feel like they were trying to split the difference. Like they were trying to cover the Duggar story, but also try to give an like an account about the background of IBLP and everything. But in, as a result, they sort of like shortchanged both sides. Well, and also, so the documentary is on Amazon Prime called Shiny Happy People, which I, I'm not in love with that name. I guess I understand why they named it that, the R.E.M. song, right? Well, yeah, and then they're supposed to... That was they were always supposed to appear that way yeah. right but it just doesn't evoke the meaning of the documentary you know i feel like there's a trend around that like wild 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 country yeah it was about the cult in oregon yeah and it's like that's not they really... need a catchy name yeah so. like the staircase that documentary it you know at least yeah. it evokes the the main topic but anyway so yeah i felt like the documentary did a great job of interweaving IBLP and everything, you know, was it, it was, you know, about the Duggars, but yeah. it really branched off into the areas that really needed to be branched off into. But what it didn't do, in my opinion, is it didn't really drive home the abuses that were happening, which we'll get into. But anyway, yeah. so the Duggars, they have a 20 year story. So we're going to go through that whole thing year by year. There's a lot of details in there. And I think it's important to go year by year so mm -hmm. that you understand the time spans involved and also the era in American history, which, you know, 20 years ago, things were different in our culture. Uh, we're going to talk about Josh Duggar, of course, who is a central figure in the controversy and criminal activity. Yeah. And the recent. Uh, uh, results of that. <laughs> also, we're going to talk a lot about the nature of sexual abuse and sexual abuse between siblings, which often isn't talked about very much, yeah. but, it, but it is a common enough occurrence. 
And of course, victim blaming and actual gaslighting, not gaslighting like the internet uh, refers to it, but the actual gaslighting effect of vic victim blaming and also of what you could argue to be a cult messaging system. Then, so that's kind of just a jumping off point. Then we're going to talk about the religion that they were in and maybe evangelicals kind of in general. Have you heard of the term fundies? Yeah. Well, no, I had, sorry. I hadn't heard fundies, but I had, I, I have met people that are recovering fundies. So when that person mentioned that term, I thought, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never heard it though. I'd... Yeah. When I was younger, and I guess to this day, the only reference to fundies I've ever heard, do you know what it is? Under roofs? Like, no, no, it was. I don't even know if this is real, but it's underwear that you buy at a sex shop that is edible. Oh, I mean, at least I think that's what it was. I know there's edible underwear, but I, fundies, that's yeah. <laughs> and you know, I, I remember I was in a, 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 a adult shop once and I found them. Do you know what they make it out of? Because they have to make something that you can wear uh, that you can eat. What can you wear and eat? Like, coffee? once I say it, it'll make all the sense in the world. I don't know. Fruit leather. You can wear fruit leather? I mean, <laughs> it's especially if it's t if it's a little thicker. I Not mean, in the summer. <laughs> well, remember fruit leather in the 80s? Mm -hmm. I feel like it was a lot more leather. I mean, it's literally yeah. called leather. Yeah, you had to uh, They would never call it that today, fruit leather. Yeah. In fact, as I say it, I'm like, was that the term that well, was the stuff you buy today is barely like paper, fruit right. paper. Right. It's like those Listerine strips that I use for breath. Have you ever had those before? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my god. They, especially when they like dry onto your tongue and they like sting. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it is a an effervescent experience. Anyway, so fundies, we're going to talk about okay. them and also Edible their fundies. their victimization. <laughs> um also, homeschooling is a huge topic. Yeah. IBLP, which is the Christian organization, is it a cult? We're going to really go into their teachings. I did a whole deep dive wormhole, rabbit hole. The teachings. Wormhole? <laughs> I wormholed. You wormholed the teachings. Um, I read their books. <laughs> I actually read their wisdom books that they use to teach the kids. I went through many of the stuff you sent me. <laughs> so we're also going to get into Bill Gothard, who is the charismatic leader of IBLP, and we'll get into his teachings and his crimes as well. We're going to get into ATI, which is the homeschooling organization. We're going to get into that book that the anonymous patron talked about to train up a child. I had never heard of it yeah, before. Yeah, never heard of that. But when I looked into it, it there's a huge amount of information there to go over, mm -hmm. and it's very influential. Millions of people wow. have been following this book. The author was in the documentary, which we'll get into. We're going to talk about gender politics, sexism, misogyny, the patriarchy, because IBLP and its sexist notions didn't just emerge out of nowhere. No, of course not. <laughs> so It's a rich, old, old tradition. <clears throat> yeah. We're going to get into actual politics because there's a lot of politicians and a lot of politics within this story to yeah. get into. We'll talk about gay panic and... We'll eventually get to QAnon because I think it's kind of related in a way. Yeah. Reality TV, a whole other topic. <laughs> See, we're going to talk about reality TV and its emergence and the ethics of it and also the ethics of using children. I have always been, for a while now, I've been talking since, you know, I've been watching reality TV on YouTube. It is a topic that sometimes I think about and I look into. Well, I use this deep dive as a, an excuse to really look into the laws and the history of the laws, not only on child labor, but specifically in entertainment and how everything is right now. And we'll get into that. We'll talk about the rise of, of, of reality TV and talk about maybe why, and I'm sure many, many tangents, such as uh, uh, fruit leather underwear. <laughs> so uh, I want to tell everyone where I did my research, by the way. I watched the documentary first, Shiny Happy People, and like I said, it's I think it's about four hours, but it just scratches the surface. It gets into a lot of things, and it's good. I, I think it, it's good that it centers. It's like a great intro. Yeah. 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 I, I think it's good because it centers the victims and interviews them a lot. But like I said, I, it just wasn't as convincing as the data that I found later. Yeah. In fact, I, while I was watching the documentary, I my wife can attest to this, when they were going into the specifics of what Bill Gothard had done criminally, sexually, harassment-wise, I was really scrutinizing what the victims were claiming. 
And there were a couple things in there, obviously, that were alarming and criminal. But it was kind of milk toast. It was yeah. kind of lackluster. It, and I remember thinking, well, either they're trumping it up to make it seem worse than it was, or they just kind of skimmed over that. Yeah. When I looked into it, it's <laughs> it's, it's a hundred times worse than well, the. Think docu- about it. You don't get kicked out of your own organization over a milk toast thing. Right. <laughs> right. You don't kick your charismatic lead. The whole reason why yeah. your organization, you know, the, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so we'll get into uh, the document. So so uh, anyway, um, so I watched the documentary. Then I listened to a lot of podcasts. So I searched on my podcast app for the Duggars mm-hmm. and everything. And there's a lot of podcasts, not only by people who are survivors or other kinds of podcasts that are, uh, focused on cult survivors or podcasts that are focused on Christianity, more mainstream Christianity in yeah. the United States, and they actually want to criticize IBLP. But also, the Duggars have podcasts of their own <laughs> that I have listened to in which they've talked about the documentary. Are there 19 podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I'm sure. Um, and I will say that most, if not all, of the commentators on the podcasts were Christians themselves. So this is a an inside critique right. of it. It's not like you and I criticizing from the outside. It's people from the inside. So it's kind of interesting the to hear. Critique is coming from inside the house. It's interesting to hear the way they talk about it too, because it's not the way you and I would talk about yeah. it, right? Well, like one of my favorite YouTubers, you might have seen him. Uh, he, wa- he was uh, Jehovah, Je- Jehovah's Witness, and he's no longer. And he criticizes that community and, and post a lot of videos it's not the only thing he does he specializes actually in cults and things like that uh but you know it's Who, who's that youtuber um I, I the name is escaping me i'll have to so i just side note one of our tangents youtubers who have terrible names to their youtube That's why channel I don't, yeah i know i i, I there i would say a lot of my favorite youtube channels if you just asked even though i've watched thousands of hours and i maybe watch them every day i'm like wait exactly. what's their name and exactly. what's the name of the channel well like uh <laughs> yeah because some of them are like okay the skeptical atheist or something you know or right but but often they're like a string of letters i know <laughs> and you could tell that they made the account in night or in, in in 2008 because that was how you did things back then yeah and they gained notoriety and they just kept right. it the same well, it's like that guy penguins penguin zero penguin z whatever yeah and he's well, that, one of the biggest biggest things yeah so i've been referring to him as penguin zero or something yeah and then people are like in the comment section like isn't that quaint that dr kirk refers to him as penguin guy when <laughs> it's his name is charlie something right but then yeah. his his whole brand the, the is called <laughs> yeah. something else well it's like so my favorite diablo 2 youtuber is mr llama do you know mr llama I don't know. But that's his name, Mr. Llama. But at least that's, you I can guess, pronounce yeah, it. Llama, yeah. I mean, Penguin Zero. But it has nothing to do with Diablo or anything. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So this podcast series also dips into, could be applied to a lot of different cults around the world, right? Or destructive groups, high control yeah. groups. Also, I watched a lot of YouTube documentaries, which were not Christians talking about it. A lot of really great documentaries. Again, I wish I mm. had them in front of me, but you can just search for them. Uh, I read a lot of articles. I researched a lot of laws in entertainment and reality TV. I also, as I said earlier, skimmed and read large sections of the wisdom books themselves, the the homeschool right. instruments. And a, a, a lot of things to get. I pulled a lot of quotes. So <laughs> it's it's interesting. Again, in the documentary, they they get into it kind of, but not as. Anyway, we just have more time. Well, before you told me about this topic that we were going to do it, I had randomly seen a whole thing on one of those crime channels about Josh Duggar, and it was all about that. So oh, you had, but I hadn't connected the dots actually oh. even though the name is not, i don't know any other duggars or something i just had like yeah there's this josh dude that i saw this day and so when i when you're like hey we need to we want to do the but the it probably duggars. wasn't a really lengthy documentary right well it was but it was like an hour and a half with police interviews and all the you know all the oh. stuff hmm. because it was about and it was about his recent stuff so it didn't talk about the old allegations it was all about the, the child pornography right. so i just knew that and then when i started looking into the duggars i'm like wait a minute 
that's that thing. <laughs> yeah, the dude has a real generic face. You yeah. know what I mean? So I could imagine it not being registered for you. Okay, so some caveats that I want to get up front. And Berto, you don't have to agree with this, but I'm not going to ridicule Christians in this series. If that's the sort of thing you're looking for, then this might not be for you. Among the 2.3 billion estimated people who identify as Christian, there are highly problematic Christians and highly problematic Christian groups, and also really ethical and wonderful Christian groups. There are Christian churches in Seattle that have queer pastors, for example, and have the gay pride flag uh, as the only flag that's waving in front of their church. Uh, not that that's uh, an indication that there aren't any problems happening, but you know what I'm saying. So uh, uh, if there's you're, a broad range. Yeah, it, yeah, there's a broad range. I'm a recovering uh, religious person, and I wouldn't have appreciated being made fun of. <laughs> there was a little period of time in the 2008 time frame where I was listening to a lot of debates and, and things with, but I don't know. It's just, I, I agree. It, it, I don't think it's conducive or fair to anyone to make fun of their, uh, of them or their beliefs and things in that sense. What I do think is it's fair to criticize when institutions and people in power in those institutions cause harm. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And Christianity is not a monolith. I've talked about the Christian church that I grew up in in the 70s, and I describe it as like hippie Christian. And I've actually asked my parents a lot about if my memories were accurate. There was no talk about anti-gay people. There was no talk about uh, the sort of things you hear from contemporary evangelical churches, right? Uh, there's no talk about pol uh, about politics. I, I don't remember that ever being a topic. In fact, when I was growing up, I was explicitly told by adults that it was impolite actually mm -hmm. to talk about politics at all. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you couldn't. It was impolite to talk about money and politics. Now you could maybe say that privileged individuals can do that, and it doesn't uh, affect them. But um, anyway, so I actually, full disclosure, have a lot of positive memories, uh, maybe exclusively positive memories. In fact, one of the only negative memories I have from church is I was with my friend and she was playing Imagine by John Lennon on the uh -huh. piano. And we were 16 or 17 and we're in the main, I don't know the what you call it. Yeah, the, the main, what do you call it? The worship room or whatever. In, at the church? Yeah, in the church. Oh, okay, yeah. The... Yeah, so it's the main piano that's yeah. you know by the pulpit and everything. Yeah. And uh, she's playing Imagine on the Piano by memory, and we're both singing it, and you know, just kind of casually, and it's pretty empty. And this new congregant walked in, mm. probably from one of the, maybe even an IBLP member yeah, for, for all I freaking know. And she was, and I was in the church since we were in a, a trailer by the fish hatchery in Issaquah, you know? Yeah, yeah. There was this little field that I think was maybe abandoned or oh something. We had this tiny little thing. And uh, by this point, we actually yeah, had a history with this place. Yeah, I, it's like, uh, yeah, I, I've been there a long yeah. time. This, this newcomer walks in and hears us playing Imagine by John Lennon. And she says, you, she, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't play that song. And we're right. like, one who are you two what <laughs> and she's like well it's like it, I can't religion yeah not only anti-religion but it was it was evil so it was it wasn't mm. just anti-religion it was like it'll infect Demonic you thing. yeah it'll 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 yeah. it's spreading evil or something right, right, you know right. and i remember the two of us immediately just i don't know if we verbally told her but in our heads we're just like you're an idiot <laughs> Like, listen to the lyrics of the song. Yeah. It says, you know, be religious if you want to, but yeah. let's focus on being right. good to people. It, so it, it, we should actually try to help people not be hungry. We should I, try I to that. end war. Like, so you are you think this song is evil just because there's this <laughs> one line where he says, no heaven above us, no hell below? Yeah, no, no. I mean, imagine no religion. Listen, I remember those sentiments. Like, so a lot, a lot of my friends, I wouldn't say my main friends, but like I had this second set of friends that were in uh, fundamentalist Christian uh, churches. And in, in Tacoma or? 
in Tacoma. Okay. Were these your non-Asian friends? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think... Yes, correct. Because famously, uh, when Berto came from Colombia... Yeah, most of my friends were Asian. ...to the United States, he somehow... Some of, some at, of my best friends were Asian. <laughs> uh, you, you, you sat down at the Asian guy table and... <laughs> well, they invited me. Like, I was at the nerd table, me and these two dudes that... AKA I, the Asian table. <laughs> No, I the was, Hufflepuff table. No, no, but I was so I was with these two other dudes, these two white dudes that I had befriended, and I was bored out of my mind because you know, like I'm nerdy, but these guys had social problems. Yeah, I don't have that. So well, wait, I've never heard the story. Tangent. Okay, tangent. <clears throat> tangent so alert. So how did uh, were they assigned to you? No, or? no, it's just I'm brand new out of the school. You know, I started in tenth grade. Yeah, I'm in, in Tacoma, and I'm at this Lakes High School. And your and, English is. Is, yeah, it's because I speak now. Right, yeah. you're, you're fluent. So, but I don't know anyone. So, you know, I'm, it's lunchtime, and so I don't know. And I, I think I met one of them in a class, so I think I had a class with one of them. And I'm like, oh, hey. So I just sit down, and we ha we did that for a few days. I think and you we, were real extroverted. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we did that for like a week. Maybe I was sitting with them for a week. So it's it's a pattern that's now established. Like we've gone several days yeah. sitting at lunch. Yeah. But I'm bored out of my mind because they... They don't have anything to talk about. I've seen this movie. It's called Can't Buy Me Love. Oh, and okay. he's And then he graduates to the cool kids. Because right. This is basically what happened to me. Yeah. I'm sitting there in the Can't Buy Me Love table. By the way, a movie I watched <laughs> like 25 times when I was a teenager. All right. And so I'm sitting there. Anyways, I had met this other guy at my youth group. So speaking of youth groups, hmm. this guy, Ty Verzoni. Super cool Vietnamese. Half, half awesome. Asian. Half yeah, Asian. Half Asian. And he tells me one day, hey, you should sit with us. And, and with us was him, a Korean, a Japanese, another half Korean, and then a white dude. <laughs> and then a, an exchange student from Germany, oh. also white. But, you know, lots of Asians in there. Yeah. And plus, their extended group included three or four other Asians. Uh, so I thought, okay, that sounds cool. But I didn't know what to do because I'm like... So did, so did you know, like, um, this is a better group. Oh, yeah, it was an upgrade for sure. And I don't want to... Not to mention, they had a band. I was kind of interested in that. I wanted to talk more about that. Yeah. So I, I'm like, how am I going to tell them? And so I sit down. It's so sad. I sit down. I'm like, hey, I'm going to go sit over there. And they look at me like, with like puppy dog eyes. Like, why? Oh, it's just... I, I don't remember, but it, it probably said something like, oh, it's because like he goes to my youth group. And, and I picked up my little lunch... And I walked away, and that was the end of that short-lived. Yeah, and they probably turned to each other and were just like, "Good, fucking." No, <laughs> they're just like, "Man, we almost had it all. <laughs> we could have had it all. He was our ticket." They might have said that, or they might have said like, "God, that guy talks a lot." <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so that was my entry into the the Asian world. Hmm. But what I was saying about the other, and then. The Japanese guy sitting at the table yeah. uh, through a friend of mine, I met you. That's how we met. That's right. But what I was saying about like the other the other groups of friends that I had that were in the uh, fundamentalist churches. In fact, one of them was kind of like my second best friend in high school. Second or third best friend in high school. But I had a lot of these acquaintances and stuff. And there was a lot of this, of what you're describing, where they would talk about the negative influences of media like songs and bands and like what almost anything that wasn't a christian band was a bad influence like madonna yeah and... oh, no, 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 no that's already you've already like you are in hell already uh. we're talking about even like like pop music that well, was not i know christian there was a controversy music. with amy grant yeah exactly because she got a divorce or something well, maybe, but the big thing was that she transitioned from purely overtly mm. Christian music okay. to pop music. Right, so then that was not okay and stuff. And it wasn't just music. There were certain movies that you shouldn't watch and stuff. And their conversations often were about demon and angel warfare. Hmm. So, like, a lot of this... What, sect, hear, what sect were they? They'd be talking about, like... They would, you know, they'd be like, well, I see, I saw, yesterday I saw this person was being me. I saw the demon rise up. Yeah. And they were always engaging in these actual, in their heads, battles for their souls and the souls of everyone around them between angels and demons. So to them, it was this real thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's and, a lot of beliefs in the world, right. but when you have a system that 
systematizes cult harm of yeah. people and society, then that's a whole other thing, right? Right. And by the way, if you were a Catholic, which at the time I was, uh, you're kind of as good as an atheist or worse, you know, or maybe not worse, but like to them, to them, yeah, because like that wasn't real Christians. Yeah, it was like so. Um, they were also very slight. Like you had to be a reborn Christian in these specific churches. Right. I think it was. I wonder. Anyway, so we'll get into that sort of thing. Also, trigger alert because we'll be getting into discussions of child abuse and physical abuse of children, and some of the descriptions and the details can't be avoided and really should be discussed. So uh, trigger alert maybe for the whole thing. I'm going to try to sprinkle them in as it's more important to point out. And another thing is that each chapter of this series will have a free portion and a patron only portion because when I spend a lot of time uh, away from other kinds of work, like at my university or in my private practice, I want to reward the patrons because they're literally giving me the money so that I can spend that time. So I'm going to quickly summarize the entire story, basically, leaving out, obviously, a lot of details of the Duggars, because that's the jumping off point here. Uh, I'm guessing some of you know it in full detail. Some of you maybe have never heard of the Duggars like I had never heard of them. So in a nutshell, the Duggars were a family on reality TV based on the fact that they had so many children. They had 19 children. At, at, well, we'll get into the specifics on that later. They had 19 children, and the show was focused on the parents and the children and maybe other family members and how they managed to make things work on uh, at, at, with so many children. You know, right. that's Which, by the way, at the time, I, I remember hearing that there was a show about a family with so many children. And, and yeah, I, I literally thought that was all of it. And I, I guess that was their angle was like, wow, yeah, how do you have that many children? That's crazy. How could you even manage? Right. I think that was the the spectacle, the circus spectacle of it. Right, exactly. They were hugely popular. They were on television for 17 years, Birdo. Wait, wait. Yeah, because they had specials before they had their TV show. So oh, if you yeah, include right. their... Yeah, I, saw, I just saw that in the... Yeah, and then they had their spinoff show. Yeah. But yeah. But it's just the timeline, because they started... Wasn't the first special 14 or something in County? Uh, I mean, they, they already had... Like, I have it all written down kids. somewhere. <laughs> it, it's, it's all in my notes. I, yeah. I have it pretty micro, but yeah, 17 years. And they'd still be on today if it weren't for right. what we'll get into. They but were even, at, even after they had spinoffs of the, some of the kids and stuff. Yeah. Right. I mean, arguably, they're still making money from their fame. Yeah. You know what I mean? One, uh, uh, this show was one of the early reality TV juggernauts that we have all come to know and love in today's world. You know, because in the 90s, of course, and you could argue that reality TV goes back before that, but it started right. in earnest with the real world. Yeah, so let's let's talk about that for a second because so first of all, when this whole Duggar Duggar family thing, in my mind, reality TV was so over because I was an early adopter of reality TV, which also to your point, it's not exactly right because yeah, there there there've been reality type shows forever really, but the real world <coughs> was such a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. right? And I think it was because at the time most of the content we consumed that wasn't like the news was like these produced kind of like fake stories and stuff and then out come these people that supposedly are just living their lives without any script well and also it was on mtv right so at the time uh, i'm sure maybe younger people might not be able to relate to this but mtv in the 80s was essentially our entire lives yeah. <laughs> our entire lives revolved around mtv and we watched everything. We watched all the interviews and all the videos and the countdowns. And when totally. you had, there was an alternative, there was a, a two hour span of time from 10 to midnight on Sundays, which isn't a good time slot. But I lived yeah. for those two hours because they had alternative bands That's that, right. that like all alternative rock wasn't a term yet. Uh, and they had bands like the Posies and other kinds of bands that I, uh, Husker Du, R.E.M., like before they were famous. And um, yeah, so when That's they, huge. so when they came, when they came out with anything, we would have watched right. it, but they had this reality TV show. And another aspect was that these kids were cool. They were cool. They were young. They were, and their music was related to it. Cause you know, yeah. and 
every one of them was kind of a an interesting personality, and they all uh, it was also sort of progressive because they started having uh, gay mm-hmm. gay uh, folks as well, and there were conflicts, and they didn't sugarcoat the conflicts. Yeah, as far as we knew, right? Like it was like they're really having an argument. Yeah, on TV. Yeah. Yeah, and it was relatable to me because literally at the time when that show was coming out, I was living with several roommates <laughs> yeah. be- because I couldn't afford to live on my own. And yeah, we fought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, And these were friends of mine that I, uh, some of them I was friends with since preschool. So, you know, we knew each other really well, more yeah. than maybe I knew my siblings. And we could really get under each other's skin. Yeah. <laughs> Um, another aspect I think of its success was that it introduced, or at least it it was it gave younger people an excuse to watch basically a soap opera. A soap operas a point. were marketed towards a different demographic. Yeah, and for our generation, we didn't have any mainstream soap opera material that was really marketed to us in this country. In Colombia, I grew up like everyone around me watched soap operas. Oh, I really? couldn't. I mean. I, I even was watching some of them because like I couldn't get away from it. Like my grandma was watching it. It was like it was all over the place. But up here, absolutely. Yeah. Kids, they were watching other stuff. Yeah. And yet you're right. That's a good observation. This is a soap opera. Yeah. And it was a part of the cultural talk. You know, yeah, every, everyone talk was about talking about it. Uh, they were in different cities. It was in New yeah. York, right? The first time eventually it's in Seattle because yeah. Seattle was all the rage. Uh, people were telling me that I should audition for right. the show. But and I, they did San Francisco. Yeah, with Puck. Yeah, Puck was the maybe. Brewery. Maybe it was was it? It was. I think it was New York, San Francisco, then Seattle or something. Um, yeah, I don't. Anyway, yeah, Puck. He's still famous. So yeah. Um, uh, so you were saying that when? What were so, you saying? Well, I was saying so like yeah, that was a big phenomenon, and that kind of kickstarted for a lot of us. Yeah. Officially, the beginning of reality TV. Right. And then MTV obviously saw that, and then they started doing a whole bunch of reality-ish type stuff, and then other channels caught on, and then all of a sudden you start seeing Survivor, and you start seeing the dating shows, who wants to date a millionaire, who wants all these kinds of things. Uh, And so I was a big consumer of reality TV through the 90s and into the 2000s, early 2000s. Like, I watched so much of that stuff. Really? What'd you watch? All of it. Because I didn't watch any of it. Certainly Survivor. Like, I, I was... Very much into survival. Well, one of the reasons, just side note, that I didn't watch any of these shows is I didn't have, I couldn't afford cable. Oh, right. Yeah. I, I, I had bunny ears that didn't work that well in an antenna, so I just watched VHS tapes. I watched, I watched a lot of movies, you yeah. know, and so I couldn't watch it. Right. But I remember the whole phenomenon around Survivor and stuff. Yeah, and so I watched that, and then we watched. I, I did get into all the dating things at first, so there was. I don't remember the first one, but it's like maybe who wants to marry a millionaire? But then there was Joe the millionaire, but then there was like who, Joe the no one or something. Like there's all these variants. And, and the of, Bachelor and all the those. Batch, all these variants. Yeah. Then there was the flavor of, but it was, there was one before. Well, there was Rock of Love. Rock of Love. And then there was, was flav- flavor, of flavor of Love. Flavor of Love, yeah. By that point, that's when I started sort of like dropping off. Hmm. But I spent a good, I don't know, eight, maybe even a decade huh. of reality TV. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, I w- completely missed it. Another reason why I didn't watch any of these shows was because I was starting to get into my career and didn't, didn't have a lot time. of didn't have a lot of time <laughs> yeah. for TV. I uh, had a hard time even watching sports. I was an avid Sonics and Seahawks fan throughout the 90s and I remember I just had to make this choice. I'm just like, mm-hmm. I have to stop because I will not be able to succeed in this career, you know, as, yeah. as a student, as a professor, I, you know, I was working all the time. Anyway, so yeah, the Duggars, the TV, various different reality TV shows became one of the early reality TV juggernauts and kickstarted the TLC phenomenon as a... And as, I didn't know that at all. Like, I didn't realize that's the thing that... I didn't either. <laughs> I did, so so it's crazy. So as many of you know, I've been watching 90 Day Fiance on uh, on YouTube, reacting to it. It's on TLC. But even a, a couple months ago, if you had asked me what channel is 90 Day Fiance on, I would have been like, uh, I, bet you, I, bet I don't know, <laughs> History like, Channel. <laughs> but but a lot of people refer to 
the TLC umbrella, you know, yeah. uh, there's a whole culture around that because it's it's been basically just so. <laughs> uh, but it was the learning channel. <laughs> right. So you and I remember yeah. when it was programming a, like educational for kids. Uh, I, it's, it's, that's my memory anyway. Well, like, they had all sorts of medical things and they had. Oh, I right. Think there was a lot of actual learning ish material. Yeah. And I think. It was but, sort of like PBS. Yeah. And and, and the, the way they described it is at first, they I do think they saw this in the vein of like, because in the documentary, they were talking about how a lot of their things were about um, odd medical situations. Like, oh, this person has a conjoined twin. And, stuff. and I think they saw it as like, wow, how do you give birth to so many people and, and keep them alive? So it's sort of like a, a medical oddity almost. <laughs> oh, interesting. I didn't catch that. But they didn't probably realize what it was going to do. Yeah, that's funny. Another factor is there was a writer strike in Hollywood, which oh, right, the first one. Wait, well, I don't know. If, I don't know if the but the one that we remember, yeah. Right, the big one we yeah. remember, and so what happened was the production companies for TV shows wow. suddenly couldn't make any of their television, so they had already known about reality TV, and they're like, well, you don't need quote unquote writers for reality TV. Yeah. And so anyway. You just need a smart producer to chop things. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you could argue there's writing because yeah. there's, they, you know, scripted-ish. But anyway, so TLC became this reality TV powerhouse because of the Duggars, you know, starting with the du Other shows would follow the Duggars, John and Kate plus eight, which maybe we'll deal a deep right. dive on them at some point. Very highly controversial family as well. Um, but... I have no knowledge of what those controversies are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, from a, I think what the show is based on is similar to the Duggars. They probably said, "Ooh, the Duggars are doing well." Well, well what's is she? The, she's not the one that had eight, 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 she, eight tuplets, right? A, a, tuplets. O Octomom. O right? That was Octomom, right? right. Yeah. Did Octomom have a TV? I just, I don't know. I just remember she was on tabloids. No, John and Kate had they just I, had eight kids they well but they had uh a, i think a set of twins and then a set of sex tuplets oh so they really okay so they did have a big <laughs> yeah output here six kids at oh, once oh my gosh so uh at least uh, five or six anyway oh. sister wives which is about a polygamous family I, right. I think lds i'm not sure hoarding tv show 2010 and i got into that quite a bit the hoarding series oh you did for a while, I don't uh, uh, still, but I did watch a lot of those episodes. So, tangent on that, we should have maybe a little sign, tangent alert. So, according to experts, including my colleague at Antioch University, Jennifer Sampson McNamara, the show is a horrible thing for people with hoarding, and oh, also really? for. Uh, but I don't know the specifics, mm. and, and also like for the culture. Them? I mean, it's good that it raises awareness yeah. of the of the problem, but yeah, it because correct me if I'm wrong. The show's premise is they confront these individuals yeah. and then they clear everything out. Yeah. Sometimes very aggressively. Like, yeah, I guess I have thought while I was watching some of them, I'm like. I don't see is this healthy for them like yeah you know i mean it certainly satisfies an itch for the viewers because including myself like not i don't think this about hoarders and people with actual <laughs> mental illnesses and disorders that have reasons as to why they exist not just that they haven't had time right. to clean you know <laughs> but uh i when i see clutter <laughs> like at yeah. my parents house or something I, i'm always like Ugh. Well, especially to that extreme but there's also the aspect that most often the episodes involve their rel relatives or close loved ones who are suffering as a result right and so there's part of it where like <clears throat> well enough is enough and stuff but i could totally see the other side which is hey when you do actually have this trauma this approach might not be or whatever you know yeah so, research even shows yeah. that not only does the hoarding uh, uh, renew itself after the film crew leaves but within a short amount of time like oh. a, like an alarmingly short amount of time, maybe just a few months, the hoarding will be worse than it was before because they have an additional oh. trauma yeah. of having been forced to face something way too fast than Oof. they were ready. Well, so, I have I have only ten. Gen I have a, a friend who's got a relative who has had hoarding disorder for as long as I can remember, and they've gone through several rounds of tabula rasa where they cleaned out and everything and then it just comes back and it's right. so disheartening yeah i mean without treatment for yeah. uh, the disorder 
and, and specialized treatment because it's really a specialized. And uh, mm-hmm. Jennifer Sampson McNamara in Tacoma has the Hoarding Project, mm-hmm. founded the Hoarding Project, that pulls together a team of oh. professionals and experts to help families. Oh, and wow. they, they go slow. They talk with the family and the individual they involve police department because sometimes you have to, yeah. or not police, but the fire department, you have to involve uh, people who understand structural problems right. of, of a home beca- or fire hazards because as a clinician, you don't want to enter a home because that's often where it has to happen, the treatment. Uh, you don't want to enter a place that you're going to die in, which you know yeah. can happen. Anyway, so hoarding, another show, w- uh, which raises the topic of the unethical harm that happens because of some reality right. TV shows, including the Duggars shows. So, Berto, I have to just, you know, abruptly pause here and say that uh, due to our ramblings, uh, we need to end the free portion here and the rest of this will just be for patrons of the podcast so if you want to hear the rest of this chapter become a patron on patreon and you'll get access to this episode and hundreds of other episodes that uh, arguably are our best episodes you know, deep dives on personality disorders other kinds of things. our full jody arias series um in full and everyone out there please take care of yourself if you're not going to be a patron because you deserve it